Some Christmas Stories By Charles Dickens A Christmas Tree I have been looking on, this evening, at a merry company of children assembled round that pretty German toy, a Christmas tree. The tree was planted in the middle of a great round table, and towered high above their heads. It was brilliantly lighted by a multitude of little tapers, and everywhere sparkled and glittered with bright objects. There were rosy-cheeked dolls, hiding behind the green leaves. And there were real watches, with movable hands, at least, and an endless capacity of being wound up, dangling from innumerable twigs. There were French polished tables, chairs, bedsteads, wardrobes, eight-day clocks, and various other articles of domestic furniture, wonderfully made, in tin, at Wolverhampton, perched among the boughs. As if in preparation for some fairy housekeeping. There were jolly, broad-faced little men, much more agreeable in appearance than many real men, and no wonder, for their heads took off, and showed them to be full of sugar plums, there were fiddles and drums. There were tambourines, books, workboxes, paint boxes, sweetmeat boxes, peep show boxes, and all kinds of boxes, there were trinkets for the elder girls, far brighter than any grown up gold and jewels. There were baskets and pincushions in all devices, there were guns, swords, and banners, there were witches standing in enchanted rings of pasteboard, to tell fortunes. There were teetotums, humming tops, needle cases, pen wipers, smelling bottles, conversation cards, bouquet holders, real fruit, made artificially dazzling with gold leaf, imitation apples, pears, and walnuts, crammed with surprises. In short, as a pretty child, before me, delightedly whispered to another pretty child, her bosom friend, there was everything, and more. This motley collection of odd objects, clustering on the tree like magic fruit, and flashing back the bright looks directed towards it from every side, some of the diamond eyes admiring it were hardly on a level with the table. And a few were languishing in timid wonder on the bosoms of pretty mothers, aunts, and nurses, made a lively realization of the fancies of childhood. And set me thinking how all the trees that grow and all the things that come into existence on the earth, have their wild adornments at that well-remembered time. Being now at home again, and alone, the only person in the house awake, my thoughts are drawn back, by a fascination which I do not care to resist, to my own childhood. I begin to consider, what do we all remember best upon the branches of the Christmas tree of our own young Christmas days, by which we climb to real life. Straight, in the middle of the room, cramped in the freedom of its growth by no encircling walls or soon reached ceiling, a shadowy tree arises. And, looking up into the dreamy brightness of its top, for I observe in this tree the singular property that it appears to grow downward towards the earth, I look into my youngest Christmas recollections. All toys at first, I find. Up yonder, among the green holly and red berries, is the tumbler with his hands in his pockets, who wouldn't lie down, but whenever he was put upon the floor, persisted in rolling his fat body about, until he rolled himself still. And brought those lobster eyes of his to bear upon me, when I affected to laugh very much, but in my heart of hearts was extremely doubtful of him. Close beside him is that infernal snuff box, out of which there sprang a demoniacal counselor in a black gown, with an obnoxious head of hair, and a red cloth mouth, wide open, who was not to be endured on any terms. But could not be put away either. For he used suddenly, in a highly magnified state, to fly out of mammoth snuff boxes in dreams, when least expected. Nor is the frog with cobbler's wax on his tail, far off, for there was no knowing where he wouldn't jump. And when he flew over the candle, and came upon one's hand with that spotted back, red on a green ground, he was horrible. The cardboard lady in a blue silk skirt, who was stood up against the candlestick to dance, and whom I see on the same branch, was milder, and was beautiful. But I can't say as much for the larger cardboard man, who used to be hung against the wall and pulled by a string, there was a sinister expression in that nose of his. And when he got his legs round his neck, which he very often did, he was ghastly, and not a creature to be alone with. When did that dreadful mask first look at me? Who put it on, and why was I so frightened that the sight of it is an era in my life? It is not a hideous visage in itself, it is even meant to be droll, why then were its stolid features so intolerable? 
surely not because it hid the wearer's face. An apron would have done as much, and though I should have preferred even the apron away, it would not have been absolutely insupportable, like the mask. Was it the immovability of the mask? The doll's face was immovable, but I was not afraid of her. Perhaps that fixed and set change coming over a real face, infused into my quickened heart some remote suggestion and dread of the universal change that is to come on every face, and make it still. Nothing reconciled me to it. No drummers, from whom proceeded a melancholy chirping on the turning of a handle, no regiment of soldiers, with a mute band, taken out of a box, and fitted, one by one, upon a stiff and lazy little set of lazy tongs. No old woman, made of wires in a brown paper composition, cutting up a pie for two small children, could give me a permanent comfort, for a long time. Nor was it any satisfaction to be shown the mask, and see that it was made of paper, or to have it locked up and be assured that no one wore it. The mere recollection of that fixed face, the mere knowledge of its existence anywhere, was sufficient to awake me in the night all perspiration and horror, with, oh I know it's coming. Oh the mask! I never wondered what the dear old donkey with the panniers, there he is, was made of, then. His hide was real to the touch, I recollect. And the great black horse with the round red spots all over him, the horse that I could even get upon, I never wondered what had brought him to that strange condition, or thought that such a horse was not commonly seen at Newmarket. The four horses of no color, next to him, that went into the wagon of cheeses, and could be taken out and stabled under the piano, appear to have bits of fur tippet for their tails, and other bits for their manies. And to stand on pegs instead of legs, but it was not so when they were brought home for a Christmas present. They were all right, then, neither was their harness unceremoniously nailed into their chests, as appears to be the case now. The tinkling works of the music cart, I did find out, to be made of quill toothpicks and wire. And I always thought that little tumbler in his shirt sleeves, perpetually swarming up one side of a wooden frame, and coming down, head foremost, on the other, rather a weak-minded person, though good-natured. But the Jacob's ladder, next him, made of little squares of red wood, that went flapping and clattering over one another, each developing a different picture, and the whole enlivened by small bells, was a mighty marvel and a great delight. Ah! The doll's house, of which I was not proprietor, but where I visited. I don't admire the Houses of Parliament half so much as that stone-fronted mansion with real glass windows, and doorsteps, and a real balcony, greener than I ever see now, except at watering places, and even they afford but a poor imitation. And though it did open all at once, the entire house front, which was a blow, I admit, as cancelling the fiction of a staircase, it was but to shut it up again, and I could believe. Even open, there were three distinct rooms in it, a sitting room and bedroom, elegantly furnished, and best of all, a kitchen, with uncommonly soft fire irons, a plentiful assortment of diminutive utensils, oh, the warming pan. And a tin man cook in profile, who was always going to fry two fish. What barmicide justice have I done to the noble feasts wherein the set of wooden platters figured, each with its own peculiar delicacy, as a ham or turkey, glued tight onto it, and garnished with something green, which I recollect as moss. Could all the temperance societies of these later days, united, give me such a tea drinking as I have had through the means of yonder little set of blue crockery, which really would hold liquid, it ran out of the small wooden cask, I recollect. And tasted of matches, and which made tea, nectar. And if the two legs of the ineffectual little sugar tongs did tumble over one another, and want purpose, like Punch's hands, what does it matter? And if I did once shriek out, as a poison child, and strike the fashionable company with consternation, by reason of having drunk a little teaspoon, inadvertently dissolved in too hot tea, I was never the worse for it, except by a powder. Upon the next branches of the tree, lower down, hard by the green roller and miniature gardening tools, how thick the books begin to hang. Thin books, in themselves, at first, but many of them, and with deliciously smooth covers of bright red or green. What fat black letters to begin with? A was an archer, and shot at a frog. Of course he was. He was an apple pie also, and there he is. He was a good many things in his time, was a, 
and so were most of his friends, except X, who had so little versatility, that I never knew him to get beyond Xerxes or Xantip, like Y, who was always confined to a yacht or a U-tree. And Z condemned forever to be a zebra or a zany. But, now, the very tree itself changes, and becomes a beanstalk, the marvelous beanstalk up which Jack climbed to the giant's house. And now, those dreadfully interesting, double-headed giants, with their clubs over their shoulders, begin to stride along the boughs in a perfect throng, dragging knights and ladies home for dinner by the hair of their heads. And Jack, how noble, with his sword of sharpness, and his shoes of swiftness. Again those old meditations come upon me as I gaze up at him. And I debate within myself whether there was more than one Jack, which I am loath to believe possible, or only one genuine original admirable Jack, who achieved all the recorded exploits. Good for Christmas time is the ruddy color of the cloak, in which, the tree making a forest of itself for her to trip through. With her basket, Little Red Riding Hood comes to me one Christmas Eve to give me information of the cruelty and treachery of that dissembling wolf who ate her grandmother, without making any impression on his appetite, and then ate her. After making that ferocious joke about his teeth. She was my first love. I felt that if I could have married Little Red Riding Hood, I should have known perfect bliss. But, it was not to be. And there was nothing for it but to look out the wolf in the Noah's Ark there, and put him late in the procession on the table, as a monster who was to be degraded. Oh the wonderful Noah's Ark! It was not found seaworthy when put in a washing tub, and the animals were crammed in at the roof, and needed to have their legs well shaken down before they could be got in, even there, and then, ten to one but they began to tumble out at the door. Which was but imperfectly fastened with a wire latch, but what was that against it? Consider the noble fly, a size or two smaller than the elephant, the ladybird, the butterfly, all triumphs of art. Consider the goose, whose feet were so small, and whose balance was so indifferent, that he usually tumbled forward, and knocked down all the animal creation. Consider Noah and his family, like idiotic tobacco stoppers. And how the leopard stuck to warm little fingers, and how the tails of the larger animals used gradually to resolve themselves into frayed bits of string. Hush! Again a forest, and somebody up in a tree, not Robin Hood, not Valentine, not the Yellow Dwarf, I have passed him in all Mother Bunch wonders, without mention, but an eastern king with a glittering scimitar and turban. By Allah! Two eastern kings, for I see another, looking over his shoulder. Down upon the grass, at the tree's foot, lies the full length of a coal-black giant, stretched asleep, with his head in a lady's lap. And near them is a glass box, fastened with four locks of shining steel, in which he keeps the lady prisoner when he is awake. I see the four keys at his girdle now. The lady makes signs to the two kings in the tree, who softly descend. It is the setting in of the bright Arabian nights. Oh, now all common things become uncommon and enchanted to me. All lamps are wonderful, all rings are talismans. Common flower pots are full of treasure, with a little earth scattered on the top, trees are for Ali Baba to hide in. Beefsteaks are to throw down into the valley of diamonds, that the precious stones may stick to them, and be carried by the eagles to their nests, whence the traders, with loud cries, will scare them. Tarts are made, according to the recipe of the vizier's son of Basora, who turned pastry cook after he was set down in his drawers at the gate of Damascus. Cobblers are all Mustafas, and in the habit of sewing up people cut into four pieces, to whom they are taken blindfold. Any iron ring let into stone is the entrance to a cave which only waits for the magician, and the little fire, and the necromancy, that will make the earth shake. All the dates imported come from the same tree as that unlucky date, with whose shell the merchant knocked out the eye of the genie's invisible sun. All olives are of the stock of that fresh fruit, concerning which the commander of the faithful overheard the boy conduct the fictitious trial of the fraudulent olive merchant. All apples are akin to the apple purchased, with two others, from the sultan's gardener for three sequins, and which the tall black slave stole from the child. All dogs are associated with the dog, really a transformed man, who jumped upon the baker's counter, and put his paw on the piece of bad money. 
All rice recalls the rice which the awful lady, who was a gull, could only peck by grains, because of her nightly feasts in the burial place. My very rocking horse, there he is, with his nostrils turned completely inside out, indicative of blood. Should have a peg in his neck, by virtue thereof to fly away with me, as the wooden horse did with the prince of Persia, in the sight of all his father's court. Yes, on every object that I recognize among those upper branches of my Christmas tree, I see this fairy light. When I wake in bed, at daybreak, on the cold, dark, winter mornings, the white snow dimly beheld, outside, through the frost on the window pane, I hear Dinar's aid. Sister, sister, if you are yet awake, I pray you finish the history of the young king of the Black Islands. Scheherazade replies, If my lord the sultan will suffer me to live another day, sister, I will not only finish that, but tell you a more wonderful story yet. Then, the gracious sultan goes out, giving no orders for the execution, and we all three breathe again. At this height of my tree I begin to see, cowering among the leaves, it may be born of turkey, or of pudding, or mince pie, or of these many fancies, jumbled with Robinson Crusoe on his desert island, Philip Quarrel among the monkeys. Sanford and Merton with Mr. Barlow, Mother Bunch, and the Mask, or it may be the result of indigestion, assisted by imagination and overdoctoring, a prodigious nightmare. It is so exceedingly indistinct, that I don't know why it's frightful, but I know it is. I can only make out that it is an immense array of shapeless things, which appear to be planted on a vast exaggeration of the lazy tongs that used to bear the toy soldiers, and to be slowly coming close to my eyes. And receding to an immeasurable distance. When it comes closest, it is worse. In connection with it I descry remembrances of winter nights incredibly long. Of being sent early to bed, as a punishment for some small offense, and waking in two hours, with a sensation of having been asleep two nights, of the laden hopelessness of morning ever dawning, and the oppression of a weight of remorse. And now, I see a wonderful row of little lights rise smoothly out of the ground, before a vast green curtain. Now, a bell rings, a magic bell, which still sounds in my ears unlike all other bells, and music plays, amidst a buzz of voices, and a fragrant smell of orange peel and oil. Anon, the magic bell commands the music to cease, and the great green curtain rolls itself up majestically, and the play begins. The devoted dog of Montargis avenges the death of his master, foully murdered in the forest of Bondi. And a humorous peasant with a red nose and a very little hat, whom I take from this hour forth to my bosom as a friend, I think he was a waiter or an hostler at a village inn, but many years have passed since he and I have met. Remarks that the sassagacity of that dog is indeed surprising. And evermore this jocular conceit will live in my remembrance fresh and unfading, overtopping all possible jokes, unto the end of time. Or now, I learn with bitter tears how poor Jane Shore, dressed all in white, and with her brown hair hanging down, went starving through the streets. Or how George Barnwell killed the worthiest uncle that ever man had, and was afterwards so sorry for it that he ought to have been let off. Come swift to comfort me, the pantomime, stupendous phenomenon. When clowns are shot from loaded mortars into the great chandelier, bright constellation that it is, when harlequins, covered all over with scales of pure gold, twist and sparkle, like amazing fish. When pantaloon, whom I deem it no irreverence to compare in my own mind to my grandfather, puts red-hot pokers in his pocket, and cries, here's somebody coming, or taxes the clown with petty larceny, by saying, now, I saw you do it. When everything is capable, with the greatest ease, of being changed into anything, and, nothing is, but thinking makes it so. Now, too, I perceive my first experience of the dreary sensation, often to return in afterlife, of being unable, next day, to get back to the dull, settled world, of wanting to live forever in the bright atmosphere I have quitted. Of doting on the little fairy, with the wand like a celestial barber's pole, and pining for a fairy immortality along with her. Ah, she comes back, in many shapes, as my eye wanders down the branches of my Christmas tree, and goes as often, and has never yet stayed by me. Out of this delight springs the toy theatre, 
there it is, with its familiar proscenium, and ladies in feathers, in the boxes. And all its attendant occupation with paste and glue, and gum, and water colors, in the getting up of the miller and his men, and Elizabeth, or the exile of Siberia. In spite of a few besetting accidents and failures, particularly an unreasonable disposition in the respectable Kelmar, and some others, to become faint in the legs, and double up, at exciting points of the drama. A teeming world of fancies so suggestive and all-embracing, that, far below it on my Christmas tree, I see dark, dirty, real theatres in the daytime, adorned with these associations as with the freshest garlands of the rarest flowers. And charming me yet. But hark! The weights are playing, and they break my childish sleep. What images do I associate with the Christmas music as I see them set forth on the Christmas tree? Known before all the others, keeping far apart from all the others, they gather round my little bed. An angel, speaking to a group of shepherds in a field, some travellers, with eyes uplifted, following a star, a baby in a manger. A child in a spacious temple, talking with grave men, a solemn figure, with a mild and beautiful face, raising a dead girl by the hand, again, near a city gate, calling back the son of a widow, on his bier, to life. A crowd of people looking through the opened roof of a chamber where he sits, and letting down a sick person on a bed, with ropes, the same, in a tempest, walking on the water to a ship, again, on a seashore, teaching a great multitude. Again, with a child upon his knee, and other children round, again, restoring sight to the blind, speech to the dumb, hearing to the deaf, health to the sick, strength to the lame, knowledge to the ignorant. Again, dying upon a cross, watched by armed soldiers, a thick darkness coming on, the earth beginning to shake, and only one voice heard, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Still, on the lower and maturer branches of the tree, Christmas associations cluster thick. School books shut up, Ovid and Virgil silenced, the rule of three, with its cool impertinent inquiries, long disposed of. Terence and Plautus acted no more, in an arena of huddled desks and forms, all chipped, and notched, and inked, cricket bats, stumps, and balls, left higher up, with the smell of trodden grass and the softened noise of shouts in the evening air. The tree is still fresh, still gay. If I no more come home at Christmas time, there will be boys and girls, thank heaven, while the world lasts, and they do. Yonder they dance and play upon the branches of my tree, God bless them, merrily, and my heart dances and plays too. And I do come home at Christmas. We all do, or we all should. We all come home, or ought to come home, for a short holiday, the longer, the better, from the great boarding school, where we are forever working at our arithmetical slates, to take, and give a rest. As to going a-visiting, where can we not go, if we will, where have we not been, when we would, starting our fancy from our Christmas tree? Away into the winter prospect. There are many such upon the tree. On, by low-lying, misty grounds, through fens and fogs, up long hills, winding dark as caverns between thick plantations, almost shutting out the sparkling stars, so, out on broad heights, until we stop at last, with sudden silence, at an avenue. The gate bell has a deep, half awful sound in the frosty air, the gate swings open on its hinges. And, as we drive up to a great house, the glancing lights grow larger in the windows, and the opposing rows of trees seem to fall solemnly back on either side, to give us place. At intervals, all day, a frightened hare has shot across this whitened turf, or the distant clatter of a herd of deer trampling the hard frost, has, for the minute, crushed the silence too. Their watchful eyes beneath the fern may be shining now, if we could see them, like the icy dewdrops on the leaves, but they are still, and all is still. And so, the lights growing larger, and the trees falling back before us, and closing up again behind us, as if to forbid retreat, we come to the house. There is probably a smell of roasted chestnuts and other good comfortable things all the time, for we are telling winter stories, ghost stories, or more shame for us, round the Christmas fire. And we have never stirred, except to draw a little nearer to it. But, no matter for that. We came to the house, and it is an old house, 
full of great chimneys where wood is burnt on ancient dogs upon the hearth, and grim portraits, some of them with grim legends, too, lower distrustfully from the oaken panels of the walls. We are a middle-aged nobleman, and we make a generous supper with our host and hostess and their guests, it being Christmas time, and the old house full of company, and then we go to bed. Our room is a very old room. It is hung with tapestry. We don't like the portrait of a cavalier in green, over the fireplace. There are great black beams in the ceiling, and there is a great black bedstead, supported at the foot by two great black figures, who seem to have come off a couple of tombs in the old baronial church in the park, for our particular accommodation. But, we are not a superstitious nobleman, and we don't mind. Well. We dismiss our servant, lock the door, and sit before the fire in our dressing gown, musing about a great many things. At length we go to bed. Well. We can't sleep. We toss and tumble, and can't sleep. The embers on the hearth burn fitfully and make the room look ghostly. We can't help peeping out over the counterpane, at the two black figures and the cavalier, that wicked-looking cavalier, in green. In the flickering light they seem to advance and retire, which, though we are not by any means a superstitious nobleman, is not agreeable. Well. We get nervous, more and more nervous. We say, this is very foolish, but we can't stand this. We'll pretend to be ill, and knock up somebody. Well. We are just going to do it, when the locked door opens, and there comes in a young woman, deadly pale, and with long fair hair, who glides to the fire, and sits down in the chair we have left there, wringing her hands. Then, we notice that her clothes are wet. Our tongue cleaves to the roof of our mouth, and we can't speak, but, we observe her accurately. Her clothes are wet, her long hair is dabbled with moist mud. She is dressed in the fashion of two hundred years ago, and she has at her girdle a bunch of rusty keys. Well. There she sits, and we can't even faint, we are in such a state about it. Presently she gets up, and tries all the locks in the room with the rusty keys, which won't fit one of them, then, she fixes her eyes on the portrait of the cavalier in green, and says, in a low, terrible voice, the stags know it. After that, she wrings her hands again, passes the bedside, and goes out at the door. We hurry on our dressing gown, seize our pistols, we always travel with pistols, and are following, when we find the door locked. We turn the key, look out into the dark gallery, no one there. We wander away, and try to find our servant. Can't be done. We pace the gallery till daybreak. Then return to our deserted room, fall asleep, and are awakened by our servant, nothing ever haunts him, and the shining sun. Well. We make a wretched breakfast, and all the company say we look queer. After breakfast, we go over the house with our host, and then we take him to the portrait of the cavalier in green, and then it all comes out. He was false to a young housekeeper once attached to that family, and famous for her beauty, who drowned herself in a pond, and whose body was discovered, after a long time, because the stags refused to drink of the water. Since which, it has been whispered that she traverses the house at midnight, but goes especially to that room where the cavalier in green was wont to sleep, trying the old locks with the rusty keys. Well. We tell our host of what we have seen, and a shade comes over his features, and he begs it may be hushed up, and so it is. But, it's all true, and we said so, before we died, we are dead now, to many responsible people. There is no end to the old houses, with resounding galleries, and dismal state bedchambers, and haunted wings shut up for many years, through which we may ramble, with an agreeable creeping up our back, and encounter any number of ghosts. But, it is worthy of remark perhaps, reducible to a very few general types and classes. For, ghosts have little originality, and, walk, in a beaten track. Thus, it comes to pass, that a certain room in a certain old hall, where a certain bad lord, baronet, knight, or gentleman, shot himself, has certain planks in the floor from which the blood will not be taken out. You may scrape and scrape, as the present owner has done, or plain and plain, as his father did, or scrub and scrub, 
as his grandfather did, or burn and burn with strong acids, as his great-grandfather did, but there the blood will still be, no redder and no paler, no more and no less, always just the same. Thus, in such another house there is a haunted door, that never will keep open. Or another door that never will keep shut, or a haunted sound of a spinning wheel, or a hammer, or a footstep, or a cry, or a sigh, or a horse's tramp, or the rattling of a chain. Or else, there is a turret clock, which, at the midnight hour, strikes thirteen when the head of the family is going to die. Or a shadowy, immovable black carriage which at such a time is always seen by somebody, waiting near the great gates in the stable yard. Or thus, it came to pass how Lady Mary went to pay a visit at a large wild house in the Scottish Highlands, and, being fatigued with her long journey, retired to bed early, and innocently said, next morning, at the breakfast table, how odd. To have so late a party last night, in this remote place, and not to tell me of it, before I went to bed. Then, every one asked Lady Mary what she meant. Then, Lady Mary replied, why, all night long, the carriages were driving round and round the terrace, underneath my window. Then, the owner of the house turned pale, and so did his lady, and Charles MacDoodle of MacDoodle signed to Lady Mary to say no more, and every one was silent. After breakfast, Charles MacDoodle told Lady Mary that it was a tradition in the family that those rumbling carriages on the terrace betokened death. And so it proved, for, two months afterwards, the lady of the mansion died. And Lady Mary, who was a maid of honor at court, often told this story to the old Queen Charlotte, by this token that the old king always said, eh, eh, what, what? Ghosts, ghosts. No such thing, no such thing. And never left off saying so, until he went to bed. Or, a friend of somebody's whom most of us know, when he was a young man at college, had a particular friend, with whom he made the compact that, if it were possible for the spirit to return to this earth after its separation from the body. He of the twain who first died, should reappear to the other. In course of time, this compact was forgotten by our friend, the two young men having progressed in life, and taken diverging paths that were wide asunder. But, one night, many years afterwards, our friend being in the north of England, and staying for the night in an inn, on the Yorkshire Moors, happened to look out of bed. And there, in the moonlight, leaning on a bureau near the window, steadfastly regarding him, saw his old college friend. The appearance being solemnly addressed, replied, in a kind of whisper, but very audibly, do not come near me. I am dead. I am here to redeem my promise. I come from another world, but may not disclose its secrets. Then, the whole form becoming paler, melted, as it were, into the moonlight, and faded away. Or, there was the daughter of the first occupier of the picturesque Elizabethan house, so famous in our neighborhood. You have heard about her? No. Why, she went out one summer evening at twilight, when she was a beautiful girl, just seventeen years of age, to gather flowers in the garden. And presently came running, terrified, into the hall to her father, saying, Oh, dear father, I have met myself. He took her in his arms, and told her it was fancy, but she said, Oh no. I met myself in the broad walk, and I was pale and gathering withered flowers, and I turned my head, and held them up. And, that night, she died. And a picture of her story was begun, though never finished, and they say it is somewhere in the house to this day, with its face to the wall. Or, the uncle of my brother's wife was riding home on horseback, one mellow evening at sunset, when, in a green lane close to his own house, he saw a man standing before him, in the very center of a narrow way. Why does that man in the cloak stand there, he thought. Does he want me to ride over him? But the figure never moved. He felt a strange sensation at seeing it so still, but slackened his trot and rode forward. When he was so close to it, as almost to touch it with his stirrup, his horse shied, and the figure glided up the bank, in a curious, unearthly manner, backward, and without seeming to use its feet, and was gone. The uncle of my brother's wife, exclaiming, Good heaven! It's my cousin Harry, from Bombay, put spurs to his horse, 
which was suddenly in a profuse sweat, and, wondering at such strange behavior, dashed round to the front of his house. There, he saw the same figure, just passing in at the long French window of the drawing room, opening on the ground. He threw his bridle to a servant, and hastened in after it. His sister was sitting there, alone. Alice, where's my cousin Harry? Your cousin Harry, John? Yes. From Bombay. I met him in the lane just now, and saw him enter here, this instant. Not a creature had been seen by any one. And in that hour and minute, as it afterwards appeared, this cousin died in India. Or, it was a certain sensible old maiden lady, who died at ninety-nine, and retained her faculties to the last, who really did see the orphan boy. A story which has often been incorrectly told, but, of which the real truth is this, because it is, in fact, a story belonging to our family, and she was a connection of our family. When she was about forty years of age, and still an uncommonly fine woman, her lover died young, which was the reason why she never married, though she had many offers, she went to stay at a place in Kent, which her brother, an Indian merchant, had newly bought. There was a story that this place had once been held in trust by the guardian of a young boy, who was himself the next heir, and who killed the young boy by harsh and cruel treatment. She knew nothing of that. It has been said that there was a cage in her bedroom in which the guardian used to put the boy. There was no such thing. There was only a closet. She went to bed, made no alarm whatever in the night, and in the morning said composedly to her maid when she came in, who is the pretty forlorn-looking child who has been peeping out of that closet all night? The maid replied by giving a loud scream, and instantly decamping. She was surprised, but she was a woman of remarkable strength of mind, and she dressed herself and went downstairs, and closeted herself with her brother. Now, Walter, she said, I have been disturbed all night by a pretty, forlorn-looking boy, who has been constantly peeping out of that closet in my room, which I can't open. This is some trick. I am afraid not, Charlotte, said he, for it is the legend of the house. It is the orphan boy. What did he do? He opened the door softly, said she, and peeped out. Sometimes, he came a step or two into the room. Then, I called to him, to encourage him, and he shrunk, and shuddered, and crept in again, and shut the door. The closet has no communication, Charlotte, said her brother, with any other part of the house, and it's nailed up. This was undeniably true, and it took two carpenters a whole forenoon to get it open, for examination. Then, she was satisfied that she had seen the orphan boy. But, the wild and terrible part of the story is, that he was also seen by three of her brother's sons, in succession, who all died young. On the occasion of each child being taken ill, he came home in a heat, twelve hours before, and said, Oh, Mama, he had been playing under a particular oak tree, in a certain meadow, with a strange boy, a pretty, forlorn-looking boy, who was very timid, and made signs. From fatal experience, the parents came to know that this was the orphan boy, and that the course of that child whom he chose for his little playmate was surely run. Legion is the name of the German castles, where we sit up alone to wait for the spectre, where we are shown into a room, made comparatively cheerful for our reception, where we glance round at the shadows. Thrown on the blank walls by the crackling fire, where we feel very lonely when the village innkeeper and his pretty daughter have retired, after laying down a fresh store of wood upon the hearth. And setting forth on the small table such supper cheer as a cold roast capon, bread, grapes, and a flask of old Rhine wine, where the reverberating doors close on their retreat, one after another, like so many peals of sullen thunder, and where. About the small hours of the night, we come into the knowledge of divers supernatural mysteries. Legion is the name of the haunted German students, in whose society we draw yet nearer to the fire, while the schoolboy in the corner opens his eyes wide and round, and flies off the footstool he has chosen for his seat. When the door accidentally blows open. Vast is the crop of such fruit, shining on our Christmas tree, in blossom, almost at the very top, ripening all down the boughs. Among the later toys and fancies hanging there, as idle often and less pure, 
be the images once associated with the sweet old waits, the softened music in the night, ever unalterable. Encircled by the social thoughts of Christmas time, still let the benignant figure of my childhood stand unchanged. In every cheerful image and suggestion that the season brings, may the bright star that rested above the poor roof, be the star of all the Christian world. A moment's pause, O oh vanishing tree, of which the lower boughs are dark to me as yet, and let me look once more. I know there are blank spaces on thy branches, where eyes that I have loved have shone and smiled, from which they are departed. But, far above, I see the razor of the dead girl, and the widow's son, and God is good. If age be hiding for me in the unseen portion of thy downward growth, O oh may I, with a grey head, turn a child's heart to that figure yet, and a child's trustfulness and confidence. Now, the tree is decorated with bright merriment, and song, and dance, and cheerfulness. And they are welcome. Innocent and welcome be they ever held, beneath the branches of the Christmas tree, which cast no gloomy shadow. But, as it sinks into the ground, I hear a whisper going through the leaves. This, in commemoration of the law of love and kindness, mercy and compassion. This, in remembrance of me. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. What Christmas is as we grow older. Time was, with most of us, when Christmas Day encircling all our limited world like a magic ring, left nothing out for us to miss or seek, bound together all our home enjoyments, affections, and hopes. Grouped everything and everyone around the Christmas fire, and made the little picture shining in our bright young eyes, complete. Time came, perhaps, all so soon, when our thoughts overleaped that narrow boundary. When there was someone, very dear, we thought then, very beautiful, and absolutely perfect, wanting to the fullness of our happiness. When we were wanting to, or we thought so, which did just as well, at the Christmas hearth by which that someone sat, and when we intertwined with every wreath and garland of our life that someone's name. That was the time for the bright visionary Christmases which have long arisen from us to show faintly, after summer rain, in the palest edges of the rainbow. That was the time for the beatified enjoyment of the things that were to be, and never were, and yet the things that were so real in our resolute hope that it would be hard to say, now, what realities achieved since, have been stronger. What? Did that Christmas never really come when we and the priceless pearl who was our young choice were received, after the happiest of totally impossible marriages, by the two united families previously at daggers, drawn on our account? When brothers and sisters-in-law who had always been rather cool to us before our relationship was affected, perfectly doted on us, and when fathers and mothers overwhelmed us with unlimited incomes? Was that Christmas dinner never really eaten, after which we arose, and generously and eloquently rendered honor to our late rival, present in the company, then and there exchanging friendship and forgiveness, and founding an attachment? Not to be surpassed in Greek or Roman story, which subsisted until death. Has that same rival long ceased to care for that same priceless pearl, and married for money, and become usurious? Above all, do we really know, now, that we should probably have been miserable if we had won and worn the pearl, and that we are better without her? That Christmas when we had recently achieved so much fame. When we had been carried in triumph somewhere, for doing something great and good, when we had won an honored and ennobled name, and arrived and were received at home in a shower of tears of joy, is it possible that that Christmas has not come yet? And is our life here, at the best, so constituted that, pausing as we advance at such a noticeable milestone in the track as this great birthday, we look back on the things that never were? As naturally and full as gravely as on the things that have been and are gone, or have been and still are. If it be so, and so it seems to be, must we come to the conclusion that life is little better than a dream, and little worth the loves and strivings that we crowd into it? No. Far be such miscalled philosophy from us, dear reader, on Christmas Day. Nearer and closer to our hearts be the Christmas spirit, 
which is the spirit of active usefulness, perseverance, cheerful discharge of duty, kindness and forbearance. It is in the last virtues especially, that we are, or should be, strengthened by the unaccomplished visions of our youth, for, who shall say that they are not our teachers to deal gently even with the impalpable nothings of the earth. Therefore, as we grow older, let us be more thankful that the circle of our Christmas associations and of the lessons that they bring, expands. Let us welcome every one of them, and summon them to take their places by the Christmas hearth. Welcome, old aspirations, glittering creatures of an ardent fancy, to your shelter underneath the holly. We know you, and have not outlived you yet. Welcome, old projects and old loves, however fleeting, to your nooks among the steadier lights that burn around us. Welcome, all that was ever real to our hearts, and for the earnestness that made you real, thanks to heaven. Do we build no Christmas castles in the clouds now? Let our thoughts, fluttering like butterflies among these flowers of children, bear witness. Before this boy, there stretches out a future, brighter than we ever looked on in our old romantic time, but bright with honor and with truth. Around this little head on which the sunny curls lie heaped, the graces sport, as prettily, as airily, as when there was no scythe within the reach of time to shear away the curls of our first love. Upon another girl's face near it, placider but smiling bright, a quiet and contented little face, we see home fairly written. Shining from the word, as rays shine from a star, we see how, when our graves are old, other hopes than ours are young, other hearts than ours are moved, how other ways are smoothed. How other happiness blooms, ripens, and decays, no, not decays, for other homes and other bands of children, not yet in being nor for ages yet to be, arise, and bloom and ripen to the end of all. Welcome, everything. Welcome, alike what has been, and what never was, and what we hope may be, to your shelter underneath the holly, to your places round the Christmas fire, where what is sits open-hearted. In yonder shadow, do we see obtruding furtively upon the blaze, an enemy's face? By Christmas Day we do forgive him. If the injury he has done us may admit of such companionship, let him come here and take his place. If otherwise, unhappily, let him go hence, assured that we will never injure nor accuse him. On this day we shut out nothing. Pause, says a low voice. Nothing. Think. On Christmas Day, we will shut out from our fireside, nothing. Not the shadow of a vast city where the withered leaves are lying deep, the voice replies. Not the shadow that darkens the whole globe. Not the shadow of the city of the dead. Not even that. Of all days in the year, we will turn our faces towards that city upon Christmas Day, and from its silent hosts bring those we loved, among us. City of the dead, in the blessed name wherein we are gathered together at this time, and in the presence that is here among us according to the promise, we will receive, and not dismiss, thy people who are dear to us. Yes. We can look upon these children angels that alight, so solemnly, so beautifully among the living children by the fire, and can bear to think how they departed from us. Entertaining angels unawares, as the patriarchs did, the playful children are unconscious of their guests, but we can see them, can see a radiant arm around one favored neck, as if there were a tempting of that child away. Among the celestial figures there is one, a poor misshapen boy on earth, of a glorious beauty now, of whom his dying mother said it grieved her much to leave him here, alone. For so many years as it was likely would elapse before he came to her, being such a little child. But he went quickly, and was laid upon her breast, and in her hand she leads him. There was a gallant boy, who fell, far away, upon a burning sand beneath a burning sun, and said, Tell them at home, with my last love, how much I could have wished to kiss them once, but that I died contented and had done my duty. Or there was another, over whom they read the words, Therefore we commit his body to the deep, and so consigned him to the lonely ocean and sailed on. Or there was another, who lay down to his rest in the dark shadow of great forests, and, on earth, awoke no more. Oh shall they not, from sand and sea and forest, be brought home at such a time? There was a dear girl, almost a woman, never to be one, who made a morning Christmas in a house of joy, 
and went her trackless way to the silent city. Do we recollect her, worn out, faintly whispering what could not be heard, and falling into that last sleep for weariness? Oh look upon her now! Oh look upon her beauty, her serenity, her changeless youth, her happiness! The daughter of Jarius was recalled to life, to die, but she, more blessed, has heard the same voice, saying unto her, Arise for ever. We had a friend who was our friend from early days, with whom we often pictured the changes that were to come upon our lives, and merrily imagined how we would speak, and walk, and think, and talk, when we came to be old. His destined habitation in the city of the dead received him in his prime. Shall he be shut out from our Christmas remembrance? Would his love have so excluded us? Lost friend, lost child, lost parent, sister, brother, husband, wife, we will not so discard you. You shall hold your cherished places in our Christmas hearts, and by our Christmas fires. And in the season of immortal hope, and on the birthday of immortal mercy, we will shut out nothing. The winter sun goes down over town and village, on the sea it makes a rosy path, as if the sacred tread were fresh upon the water. A few more moments, and it sinks, and night comes on, and lights begin to sparkle in the prospect. On the hillside beyond the shapelessly diffused town, and in the quiet keeping of the trees that gird the village steeple, remembrances are cut in stone, planted in common flowers, growing in grass. Entwined with lowly brambles around many a mound of earth. In town and village, there are doors and windows closed against the weather, there are flaming logs heaped high, there are joyful faces, there is healthy music of voices. Be all ungentleness and harm excluded from the temples of the household gods, but be those remembrances admitted with tender encouragement. They are of the time and all its comforting and peaceful reassurances. And of the history that reunited even upon earth the living and the dead, and of the broad beneficence and goodness that too many men have tried to tear to narrow shreds. The Poor Relation Story He was very reluctant to take precedence of so many respected members of the family, by beginning the round of stories they were to relate as they sat in a goodly circle by the Christmas fire. And he modestly suggested that it would be more correct if John our esteemed host, whose health he begged to drink, would have the kindness to begin. For as to himself, he said, he was so little used to lead the way that really, but as they all cried out here, that he must begin, and agreed with one voice that he might, could, would, and should begin, he left off rubbing his hands. And took his legs out from under his armchair, and did begin. I have no doubt, said the poor relation, that I shall surprise the assembled members of our family, and particularly John our esteemed host to whom we are so much indebted for the great hospitality with which he has this day entertained us. By the confession I am going to make. But, if you do me the honor to be surprised at anything that falls from a person so unimportant in the family as I am, I can only say that I shall be scrupulously accurate in all I relate. I am not what I am supposed to be. I am quite another thing. Perhaps before I go further, I had better glance at what I am supposed to be. It is supposed, unless I mistake, the assembled members of our family will correct me if I do, which is very likely, here the poor relation looked mildly about him for contradiction, that I am nobody's enemy but my own. That I never met with any particular success in anything. That I failed in business because I was unbusinesslike and credulous, in not being prepared for the interested designs of my partner. That I failed in love, because I was ridiculously trustful, in thinking it impossible that Christiana could deceive me. That I failed in my expectations from my uncle Chill, on account of not being as sharp as he could have wished in worldly matters. That, through life, I have been rather put upon and disappointed in a general way. That I am at present a bachelor of between fifty-nine and sixty years of age, living on a limited income in the form of a quarterly allowance, to which I see that John our esteemed host wishes me to make no further allusion. The supposition as to my present pursuits and habits is to the following effect. I live in a lodging in the Clapham Road, a very clean back room, in a very respectable house, where I am expected not to be at home in the daytime, unless poorly. And which I usually leave in the morning at nine o'clock, on pretense of going to business. I take my breakfast, my roll and butter, and my half pint of coffee, 
at the old established coffee shop near Westminster Bridge. And then I go into the city, I don't know why, and sit in Garraway's coffee house, and on change, and walk about, and look into a few offices and counting houses where some of my relations or acquaintance are so good as to tolerate me. And where I stand by the fire if the weather happens to be cold. I get through the day in this way until five o'clock, and then I dine, at a cost, on the average, of one and threepence. Having still a little money to spend on my evening's entertainment, I look into the old established coffee shop as I go home, and take my cup of tea, and perhaps my bit of toast. So, as the large hand of the clock makes its way round to the morning hour again, I make my way round to the Clapham Road again, and go to bed when I get to my lodging, fire being expensive. And being objected to by the family on account of its giving trouble and making a dirt. Sometimes, one of my relations or acquaintances is so obliging as to ask me to dinner. Those are holiday occasions, and then I generally walk in the park. I am a solitary man, and seldom walk with anybody. Not that I am avoided because I am shabby, for I am not at all shabby, having always a very good suit of black on, or rather Oxford mixture, which has the appearance of black and wears much better. But I have got into a habit of speaking low, and being rather silent, and my spirits are not high, and I am sensible that I am not an attractive companion. The only exception to this general rule is the child of my first cousin, little Frank. I have a particular affection for that child, and he takes very kindly to me. He is a diffident boy by nature, and in a crowd he is soon run over, as I may say, and forgotten. He and I, however, get on exceedingly well. I have a fancy that the poor child will in time succeed to my peculiar position in the family. We talk but little, still, we understand each other. We walk about, hand in hand. And without much speaking he knows what I mean, and I know what he means. When he was very little indeed, I used to take him to the windows of the toy shops, and show him the toys inside. It is surprising how soon he found out that I would have made him a great many presents if I had been in circumstances to do it. Little Frank and I go and look at the outside of the monument, he is very fond of the monument, and at the bridges, and at all the sites that are free. On two of my birthdays, we have dined on a la mode beef, and gone at half price to the play, and been deeply interested. I was once walking with him in Lombard Street, which we often visit on account of my having mentioned to him that there are great riches there, he is very fond of Lombard Street, when a gentleman said to me as he passed by, Sir. Your little son has dropped his glove. I assure you, if you will excuse my remarking on so trivial a circumstance, this accidental mention of the child as mine, quite touched my heart and brought the foolish tears into my eyes. When little Frank is sent to school in the country, I shall be very much at a loss what to do with myself, but I have the intention of walking down there once a month and seeing him on a half holiday. I am told he will then be at play upon the heath, and if my visits should be objected to, as unsettling the child, I can see him from a distance without his seeing me, and walk back again. His mother comes of a highly genteel family, and rather disapproves, I am aware, of our being too much together. I know that I am not calculated to improve his retiring disposition. But I think he would miss me beyond the feeling of the moment if we were wholly separated. When I die in the Clapham Road, I shall not leave much more in this world than I shall take out of it. But, I happen to have a miniature of a bright-faced boy, with a curling head, and an open shirt frill waving down his bosom, my mother had it taken for me, but I can't believe that it was ever like, which will be worth nothing to sell and which I shall beg may he give in to Frank. I have written my dear boy a little letter with it, in which I have told him that I felt very sorry to part from him, though bound to confess that I knew no reason why I should remain here. I have given him some short advice, the best in my power, to take warning of the consequences of being nobody's enemy but his own. And I have endeavoured to comfort him for what I fear he will consider a bereavement, by pointing out to him, that I was only a superfluous something to every one but him. And that having by some means failed to find a place in this great assembly, I am better out of it. Such, said the poor relation, clearing his throat and beginning to speak a little louder, is the general impression about me. 
Now, it is a remarkable circumstance which forms the aim and purpose of my story, that this is all wrong. This is not my life, and these are not my habits. I do not even live in the Clapham Road. Comparatively speaking, I am very seldom there. I reside, mostly, in a, I am almost ashamed to say the word, it sounds so full of pretension, in a castle. I do not mean that it is an old baronial habitation, but still it is a building always known to everyone by the name of a castle. In it, I preserve the particulars of my history. They run thus. It was when I first took John Spatter, who had been my clerk, into partnership, and when I was still a young man of not more than five and twenty, residing in the house of my uncle Chill, from whom I had considerable expectations. That I ventured to propose to Christiana. I had loved Christiana a long time. She was very beautiful, and very winning in all respects. I rather mistrusted her widowed mother, who I feared was of a plotting and mercenary turn of mind. But, I thought as well of her as I could, for Christiana's sake. I never had loved any one but Christiana, and she had been all the world, and oh far more than all the world, to me, from our childhood. Christiana accepted me with her mother's consent, and I was rendered very happy indeed. My life at my uncle Chill's was of a spare dull kind, and my garret chamber was as dull, and bare, and cold, as an upper prison room in some stern northern fortress. But, having Christiana's love, I wanted nothing upon earth. I would not have changed my lot with any human being. Avarice was, unhappily, my uncle Chill's master vice. Though he was rich, he pinched, and scraped, and clutched, and lived miserably. As Christiana had no fortune, I was for some time a little fearful of confessing our engagement to him, but, at length I wrote him a letter, saying how it all truly was. I put it into his hand one night, on going to bed. As I came downstairs next morning, shivering in the cold December air. Colder in my uncle's unwarmed house than in the street, where the winter sun did sometimes shine, and which was at all events enlivened by cheerful faces and voices passing along. I carried a heavy heart towards the long, low breakfast room in which my uncle sat. It was a large room with a small fire, and there was a great bay window in it which the rain had marked in the night as if with the tears of houseless people. It stared upon a raw yard, with a cracked stone pavement, and some rusted iron railings half uprooted, whence an ugly outbuilding that had once been a dissecting room, in the time of the great surgeon who had mortgaged the house to my uncle. Stared at it. We rose so early always, that at that time of the year we breakfasted by candlelight. When I went into the room, my uncle was so contracted by the cold, and so huddled together in his chair behind the one dim candle, that I did not see him until I was close to the table. As I held out my hand to him, he caught up his stick, being infirm, he always walked about the house with a stick, and made a blow at me, and said, You fool! Uncle, I returned, I didn't expect you to be so angry as this. Nor had I expected it, though he was a hard and angry old man. You didn't expect, said he, when did you ever expect? When did you ever calculate, or look forward, you contemptible dog? These are hard words, uncle. Hard words. Feathers, to pelt such an idiot as you with, said he. Here. Betsy Snap. Look at him. Betsy Snap was a withered, hard-favored, yellow old woman, our only domestic, always employed, at this time of the morning, in rubbing my uncle's legs. As my uncle adjured her to look at me, he put his lean grip on the crown of her head, she kneeling beside him, and turned her face towards me. An involuntary thought connecting them both with the dissecting room, as it must often have been in the surgeon's time, passed across my mind in the midst of my anxiety. Look at the sniveling milksop, said my uncle. Look at the baby. This is the gentleman who, people say, is nobody's enemy but his own. This is the gentleman who can't say no. This is the gentleman who was making such large profits in his business that he must needs take a partner, t'other day. This is the gentleman who is going to marry a wife without a penny, and who falls into the hands of Jezebels who are speculating on my death. I knew, now, how great my uncle's rage was. 
for nothing short of his being almost beside himself would have induced him to utter that concluding word, which he held in such repugnance that it was never spoken or hinted at before him on any account. On my death, he repeated, as if he were defying me by defying his own abhorrence of the word. On my death, death, death. But I'll spoil the speculation. Eat your last under this roof, you feeble wretch, and may it choke you. You may suppose that I had not much appetite for the breakfast to which I was bidden in these terms, but, I took my accustomed seat. I saw that I was repudiated henceforth by my uncle. Still I could bear that very well, possessing Christiana's heart. He emptied his basin of bread and milk as usual, only that he took it on his knees with his chair turned away from the table where I sat. When he had done, he carefully snuffed out the candle, and the cold, slate-colored, miserable day looked in upon us. Now, Mr. Michael, said he, before we part, I should like to have a word with these ladies in your presence. As you will, sir, I returned, but you deceive yourself, and wrong us, cruelly, if you suppose that there is any feeling at stake in this contract but pure, disinterested, faithful love. To this, he only replied, you lie. And not one other word. We went, through half-thawed snow and half-frozen rain, to the house where Christiana and her mother lived. My uncle knew them very well. They were sitting at their breakfast, and were surprised to see us at that hour. Your servant, ma'am, said my uncle to the mother. You divine the purpose of my visit, I dare say, ma'am. I understand there is a world of pure, disinterested, faithful love cooped up here. I am happy to bring it all at once, to make it complete. I bring you your son-in-law, ma'am, and you, your husband, miss. The gentleman is a perfect stranger to me, but I wish him joy of his wise bargain. He snarled at me as he went out, and I never saw him again. It is altogether a mistake, continued the poor relation, to suppose that my dear Christiana, over-persuaded and influenced by her mother, married a rich man, the dirt from whose carriage wheels is often, in these changed times, thrown upon me as she rides by. No, no. She married me. The way we came to be married rather sooner than we intended, was this. I took a frugal lodging and was saving and planning for her sake, when, one day, she spoke to me with great earnestness, and said. My dear Michael, I have given you my heart. I have said that I loved you, and I have pledged myself to be your wife. I am as much yours through all changes of good and evil as if we had been married on the day when such words passed between us. I know you well, and know that if we should be separated and our union broken off, your whole life would be shadowed, and all that might, even now. Be stronger in your character for the conflict with the world would then be weakened to the shadow of what it is. God help me, Christiana, said I. You speak the truth. Michael, said she, putting her hand in mine, in all maidenly devotion, let us keep apart no longer. It is but for me to say that I can live contented upon such means as you have, and I well know you are happy. I say so from my heart. Strive no more alone, let us strive together. My dear Michael, it is not right that I should keep secret from you what you do not suspect, but what distresses my whole life. My mother, without considering that what you have lost, you have lost for me, and on the assurance of my faith, sets her heart on riches, and urges another suit upon me, to my misery. I cannot bear this, for to bear it is to be untrue to you. I would rather share your struggles than look on. I want no better home than you can give me. I know that you will aspire and labor with a higher courage if I am wholly yours, and let it be so when you will. I was blessed indeed, that day, and a new world opened to me. We were married in a very little while, and I took my wife to our happy home. That was the beginning of the residence I have spoken of. The castle we have ever since inhabited together, dates from that time. All our children have been born in it. Our first child, now married, was a little girl, whom we called Christiana. Her son is so like little Frank, that I hardly know which is which. The current impression as to my partner's dealings with me is also quite erroneous. He did not begin to treat me coldly, as a poor simpleton, 
when my uncle and I so fatally quarreled, nor did he afterwards gradually possess himself of our business and edge me out. On the contrary, he behaved to me with the utmost good faith and honor. Matters between us took this turn, on the day of my separation from my uncle, and even before the arrival at our counting house of my trunks, which he sent after me, not carriage paid, I went down to our room of business, on our little wharf. Overlooking the river. And there I told John Spatter what had happened. John did not say, in reply, that rich old relatives were palpable facts, and that love and sentiment were moonshine and fiction. He addressed me thus. Michael, said John, we were at school together, and I generally had the knack of getting on better than you, and making a higher reputation. You had, John, I returned. Although, said John, I borrowed your books and lost them, borrowed your pocket money, and never repaid it, got you to buy my damaged knives at a higher price than I had given for them new, and to own to the windows that I had broken. All not worth mentioning, John Spatter, said I, but certainly true. When you were first established in this infant business, which promises to thrive so well, pursued John, I came to you, in my search for almost any employment, and you made me your clerk. Still not worth mentioning, my dear John Spatter, said I, still, equally true. And finding that I had a good head for business, and that I was really useful to the business, you did not like to retain me in that capacity, and thought it an act of justice soon to make me your partner. Still less worth mentioning than any of those other little circumstances you have recalled, John Spatter, said I, for I was, and am, sensible of your merits and my deficiencies. Now, my good friend, said John, drawing my arm through his, as he had had a habit of doing at school. While two vessels outside the windows of our counting house, which were shaped like the stern windows of a ship, went lightly down the river with the tide, as John and I might then be sailing away in company, and in trust and confidence. On our voyage of life. Let there, under these friendly circumstances, be a right understanding between us. You are too easy, Michael. You are nobody's enemy but your own. If I were to give you that damaging character among our connection, with a shrug, and a shake of the head, and a sigh, and if I were further to abuse the trust you place in me. But you never will abuse it at all, John, I observed. Never. Said he. But I am putting a case, I say, and if I were further to abuse that trust by keeping this piece of our common affairs in the dark, and this other piece in the light, and again this other piece in the twilight, and so on. I should strengthen my strength, and weaken your weakness, day by day, until at last I found myself on the high road to fortune, and you left behind on some bare common, a hopeless number of miles out of the way. Exactly so, said I. To prevent this, Michael, said John Spatter, or the remotest chance of this, there must be perfect openness between us. Nothing must be concealed, and we must have but one interest. My dear John Spatter, I assured him, that is precisely what I mean. And when you are too easy, pursued John, his face glowing with friendship, you must allow me to prevent that imperfection in your nature from being taken advantage of, by any one. You must not expect me to humor it. My dear John Spatter, I interrupted, I don't expect you to humor it. I want to correct it. And I, too, said John. Exactly so, cried I. We both have the same end in view. And, honorably seeking it, and fully trusting one another, and having but one interest, ours will be a prosperous and happy partnership. I am sure of it, returned John Spatter. And we shook hands most affectionately. I took John home to my castle, and we had a very happy day. Our partnership throve well. My friend and partner supplied what I wanted, as I had foreseen that he would, and by improving both the business and myself, amply acknowledged any little rise in life to which I had helped him. I am not, said the poor relation, looking at the fire as he slowly rubbed his hands, very rich, for I never cared to be that, but I have enough, and am above all moderate wants and anxieties. My castle is not a splendid place, but it is very comfortable, and it has a warm and cheerful air, and is quite a picture of home. Our eldest girl, who is very like her mother, married John Spatter's eldest son. 
our two families are closely united in other ties of attachment. It is very pleasant of an evening, when we are all assembled together, which frequently happens, and when John and I talk over old times, and the one interest there has always been between us. I really do not know, in my castle, what loneliness is. Some of our children or grandchildren are always about it, and the young voices of my descendants are delightful, oh, how delightful, to me to hear. My dearest and most devoted wife, ever faithful, ever loving, ever helpful and sustaining and consoling, is the priceless blessing of my house, from whom all its other blessings spring. We are rather a musical family, and when Christiana sees me, at any time, a little weary or depressed, she steals to the piano and sings a gentle air she used to sing when we were first betrothed. So weak a man am I, that I cannot bear to hear it from any other source. They played it once, at the theatre, when I was there with little Frank. And the child said wondering, Cousin Michael, whose hot tears are these that have fallen on my hand. Such is my castle, and such are the real particulars of my life therein preserved. I often take little Frank home there. He is very welcome to my grandchildren, and they play together. At this time of the year, the Christmas and New Year time, I am seldom out of my castle. For, the associations of the season seem to hold me there, and the precepts of the season seem to teach me that it is well to be there. And the castle is, observed a grave, kind voice among the company. Yes. My castle, said the poor relation, shaking his head as he still looked at the fire, is in the air. John our esteemed host suggests its situation accurately. My castle is in the air. I have done. Will you be so good as to pass the story? The Child's Story Once upon a time, a good many years ago, there was a traveller, and he set out upon a journey. It was a magic journey, and was to seem very long when he began it, and very short when he got halfway through. He travelled along a rather dark path for some little time, without meeting anything, until at last he came to a beautiful child. So he said to the child, What do you do here? And the child said, I am always at play. Come and play with me. So, he played with that child, the whole day long, and they were very merry. The sky was so blue, the sun was so bright, the water was so sparkling, the leaves were so green, the flowers were so lovely, and they heard such singing birds and saw so many butteries, that everything was beautiful. This was in fine weather. When it rained, they loved to watch the falling drops, and to smell the fresh scents. When it blew, it was delightful to listen to the wind, and fancy what it said, as it came rushing from its home, where was that, they wondered. Whistling and howling, driving the clouds before it, bending the trees, rumbling in the chimneys, shaking the house, and making the sea roar in fury. But, when it snowed, that was best of all. For, they liked nothing so well as to look up at the white flakes falling fast and thick, like down from the breasts of millions of white birds, and to see how smooth and deep the drift was, and to listen to the hush upon the paths and roads. They had plenty of the finest toys in the world, and the most astonishing picture books, all about scimitars and slippers and turbans, and dwarfs and giants and genii and fairies. And bluebeards and beanstalks and riches and caverns and forests and valentines and orsons, and all new and all true. But, one day, of a sudden, the traveller lost the child. He called to him over and over again, but got no answer. So, he went upon his road, and went on for a little while without meeting anything, until at last he came to a handsome boy. So, he said to the boy, What do you do here? And the boy said, I am always learning. Come and learn with me. So he learned with that boy about Jupiter and Juno, and the Greeks and the Romans, and I don't know what, and learned more than I could tell, or he either, for he soon forgot a great deal of it. But, they were not always learning. They had the merriest games that ever were played. They rode upon the river in summer, and skated on the ice in winter, they were active afoot, and active on horseback at cricket, and all games at ball. At prisoner's base, hare and hounds, follow my leader, and more sports than I can think of, nobody could beat them. They had holidays too, 
and twelfth cakes, and parties where they danced till midnight, and real theatres where they saw palaces of real gold and silver rise out of the real earth, and saw all the wonders of the world at once. As to friends, they had such dear friends and so many of them, that I want the time to reckon them up. They were all young, like the handsome boy, and were never to be strange to one another all their lives through. Still, one day, in the midst of all these pleasures, the traveller lost the boy as he had lost the child, and, after calling to him in vain, went on upon his journey. So he went on for a little while without seeing anything, until at last he came to a young man. So, he said to the young man, What do you do here? And the young man said, I am always in love. Come and love with me. So, he went away with that young man, and presently they came to one of the prettiest girls that ever was seen, just like Fanny in the corner there, and she had eyes like Fanny, and hair like Fanny, and dimples like Fanny's. And she laughed and colored just as Fanny does while I am talking about her. So, the young man fell in love directly, just as somebody I won't mention, the first time he came here, did with Fanny. Well. He was teased sometimes, just as somebody used to be by Fanny. And they quarreled sometimes, just as somebody and Fanny used to quarrel. And they made it up, and sat in the dark, and wrote letters every day, and never were happy asunder, and were always looking out for one another and pretending not to, and were engaged at Christmas time, and sat close to one another by the fire. And were going to be married very soon, all exactly like somebody I won't mention, and Fanny. But, the traveller lost them one day, as he had lost the rest of his friends, and, after calling to them to come back, which they never did, went on upon his journey. So, he went on for a little while without seeing anything, until at last he came to a middle-aged gentleman. So, he said to the gentleman, What are you doing here? And his answer was, I am always busy. Come and be busy with me. So, he began to be very busy with that gentleman, and they went on through the wood together. The whole journey was through a wood, only it had been open and green at first, like a wood in spring. And now began to be thick and dark, like a wood in summer, some of the little trees that had come out earliest, were even turning brown. The gentleman was not alone, but had a lady of about the same age with him, who was his wife. And they had children, who were with them too. So, they all went on together through the wood, cutting down the trees, and making a path through the branches and the fallen leaves, and carrying burdens, and working hard. Sometimes, they came to a long green avenue that opened into deeper woods. Then they would hear a very little, distant voice crying, Father, Father, I am another child. Stop for me. And presently they would see a very little figure, growing larger as it came along, running to join them. When it came up, they all crowded round it, and kissed and welcomed it, and then they all went on together. Sometimes, they came to several avenues at once, and then they all stood still, and one of the children said, Father, I am going to sea, and another said, Father, I am going to India, and another, Father. I am going to seek my fortune where I can, and another, Father, I am going to heaven. So, with many tears at parting, they went, solitary, down those avenues, each child upon its way, and the child who went to heaven, rose into the golden air and vanished. Whenever these partings happened, the traveller looked at the gentleman, and saw him glance up at the sky above the trees, where the day was beginning to decline, and the sunset to come on. He saw, too, that his hair was turning grey. But, they never could rest long, for they had their journey to perform, and it was necessary for them to be always busy. At last, there had been so many partings that there were no children left, and only the traveller, the gentleman, and the lady, went upon their way in company. And now the wood was yellow, and now brown. And the leaves, even of the forest trees, began to fall. So, they came to an avenue that was darker than the rest, and were pressing forward on their journey without looking down it when the lady stopped. My husband, said the lady. I am called. They listened, and they heard a voice a long way down the avenue, say, Mother, Mother. It was the voice of the first child who had said, I am going to heaven, and the father said, I pray not yet. The sunset is very near. 
I pray not yet. But, the voice cried, Mother, mother, without minding him, though his hair was now quite white and tears were on his face. Then, the mother, who was already drawn into the shade of the dark avenue and moving away with her arm still round his neck, kissed him, and said, My dearest, I am summoned, and I go. And she was gone. And the traveller and he were left alone together. And they went on and on together, until they came to very near the end of the wood, so near, that they could see the sunset shining red before them through the trees. Yet, once more, while he broke his way among the branches, the traveller lost his friend. He called and called, but there was no reply, and when he passed out of the wood, and saw the peaceful sun going down upon a wide purple prospect, he came to an old man sitting on a fallen tree. So, he said to the old man, What do you do here? And the old man said with a calm smile, I am always remembering. Come and remember with me. So the traveller sat down by the side of that old man, face to face with the serene sunset, and all his friends came softly back and stood around him. The beautiful child, the handsome boy, the young man in love, the father, mother, and children, every one of them was there, and he had lost nothing. So, he loved them all, and was kind and forbearing with them all, and was always pleased to watch them all, and they all honoured and loved him. And I think the traveller must be yourself, dear grandfather, because this what you do to us, and what we do to you. The Schoolboy's Story Being rather young at present, I am getting on in years, but still I am rather young, I have no particular adventures of my own to fall back upon. It wouldn't much interest anybody here, I suppose, to know what a screw the reverend is, or what a griffin she is, or how they do stick it into parents, particularly haircutting, and medical attendance. One of our fellows was charged in his half's account twelve and sixpence for two pills, tolerably profitable at six and threepence apiece, I should think, and he never took them either, but put them up the sleeve of his jacket. As to the beef, it's shameful. It's not beef. Regular beef isn't veins. You can chew regular beef. Besides which, there's gravy to regular beef, and you never see a drop to ours. Another of our fellows went home ill, and heard the family doctor tell his father that he couldn't account for his complaint unless it was the beer. Of course it was the beer, and well it might be. However, beef and old cheesemen are two different things. So is beer. It was old cheesemen I meant to tell about, not the manner in which our fellows get their constitutions destroyed for the sake of profit. Why, look at the pie crust alone. There's no flakiness in it. It's solid, like damp lead. Then our fellows get nightmares, and are bolstered for calling out and waking other fellows. Who can wonder? Old Cheeseman one night walked in his sleep, put his hat on over his nightcap, got hold of a fishing rod and a cricket bat, and went down into the parlor, where they naturally thought from his appearance he was a ghost. Why, he never would have done that if his meals had been wholesome. When we all begin to walk in our sleeps, I suppose they'll be sorry for it. Old Cheeseman wasn't second Latin master then, he was a fellow himself. He was first brought there, very small, in a post-chaise, by a woman who was always taking snuff and shaking him, and that was the most he remembered about it. He never went home for the holidays. His accounts, he never learnt any extras, were sent to a bank, and the bank paid them, and he had a brown suit twice a year, and went into boots at twelve. They were always too big for him, too. In the midsummer holidays, some of our fellows who lived within walking distance, used to come back and climb the trees outside the playground wall, on purpose to look at old cheeseman reading there by himself. He was always as mild as the tea, and that's pretty mild, I should hope, so when they whistled to him, he looked up and nodded, and when they said, Hello, old cheeseman, what have you had for dinner, he said, boiled mutton. And when they said, And it's solitary, old cheeseman, he said, It is a little dull sometimes, and then they said, Well goodbye, old cheeseman, and climbed down again. Of course it was imposing on old cheeseman to give him nothing but boiled mutton through a whole vacation, but that was just like the system. When they didn't give him boiled mutton, they gave him rice pudding, pretending it was a treat. And saved the butcher. So old cheeseman went on. 
The holidays brought him into other trouble besides the loneliness, because when the fellows began to come back, not wanting to, he was always glad to see them. Which was aggravating when they were not at all glad to see him, and so he got his head knocked against walls, and that was the way his nose bled. But he was a favorite in general. Once a subscription was raised for him. And, to keep up his spirits, he was presented before the holidays with two white mice, a rabbit, a pigeon, and a beautiful puppy. Old Cheeseman cried about it, especially soon afterwards, when they all ate one another. Of course Old Cheeseman used to be called by the names of all sorts of cheeses, Double Glosterman, Family Cheshireman, Dutchman, North Wiltshireman, and all that. But he never minded it. And I don't mean to say he was old in point of years, because he wasn't, only he was called from the first, Old Cheeseman. At last, Old Cheeseman was made second Latin master. He was brought in one morning at the beginning of a new half, and presented to the school in that capacity as, Mr. Cheeseman. Then our fellows all agreed that Old Cheeseman was a spy, and a deserter, who had gone over to the enemy's camp, and sold himself for gold. It was no excuse for him that he had sold himself for very little gold, two pound ten a quarter in his washing, as was reported. It was decided by a parliament which sat about it, that Old Cheeseman's mercenary motives could alone be taken into account, and that he had, coined our blood for drachmas. The parliament took the expression out of the quarrel scene between Brutus and Cassius. When it was settled in this strong way that Old Cheeseman was a tremendous traitor, who had wormed himself into our fellow's secrets on purpose to get himself into favor by giving up everything he knew. All courageous fellows were invited to come forward and enroll themselves in a society for making a set against him. The president of the society was first boy, named Bob Tartar. His father was in the West Indies, and he owned, himself, that his father was worth millions. He had great power among our fellows, and he wrote a parody, beginning who made believe to be so meek, that we could hardly hear him speak, yet turned out an informing sneak, old cheeseman, and on in that way through more than a dozen verses, which he used to go and sing, every morning, close by the new master's desk. He trained one of the low boys, too, a rosy-cheeked little brass who didn't care what he did, to go up to him with his Latin grammar one morning, and say it so, nominativus pronominum, old cheeseman, Raro exprimator, was never suspected. Nisi distinction ease, of being an informer, aut emphasis gratia, until he proved one. Ut, for instance, vos damnastis, when he sold the boys. Quasi, as though, dicat, he should say, preteria nemo, I'm a Judas. All this produced a great effect on old cheeseman. He had never had much hair. But what he had, began to get thinner and thinner every day. He grew paler and more worn, and sometimes of an evening he was seen sitting at his desk with a precious long snuff to his candle, and his hands before his face, crying. But no member of the society could pity him, even if he felt inclined, because the president said it was Old Cheeseman's conscience. So Old Cheeseman went on, and didn't he lead a miserable life? Of course the reverend turned up his nose at him, and of course she did, because both of them always do that at all the masters, but he suffered from the fellows most, and he suffered from them constantly. He never told about it, that the society could find out, but he got no credit for that, because the president said it was old cheeseman's cowardice. He had only one friend in the world, and that one was almost as powerless as he was, for it was only Jane. Jane was a sort of wardrobe woman to our fellows, and took care of the boxes. She had come at first, I believe, as a kind of apprentice, some of our fellows say from a charity, but I don't know, and after her time was out, had stopped at so much a year. So little a year, perhaps I ought to say, for it is far more likely. However, she had put some pounds in the savings bank, and she was a very nice young woman. She was not quite pretty, but she had a very frank, honest, bright face, and all our fellows were fond of her. She was uncommonly neat and cheerful, and uncommonly comfortable and kind. And if anything was the matter with a fellow's mother, he always went and showed the letter to Jane. Jane was old Cheeseman's friend. The more the society went against him, 
the more Jane stood by him. She used to give him a good-humored look out of her still-room window, sometimes, that seemed to set him up for the day. She used to pass out of the orchard and the kitchen garden, always kept locked, I believe you, through the playground, when she might have gone the other way, only to give a turn of her head, as much as to say, keep up your spirits. To Old Cheeseman His slip of a room was so fresh and orderly that it was well known who looked after it while he was at his desk. And when our fellows saw a smoking hot dumpling on his plate at dinner, they knew with indignation who had sent it up. Under these circumstances, the society resolved, after a quantity of meeting and debating, that Jane should be requested to cut Old Cheeseman dead, and that if she refused, she must be sent to Coventry herself. So a deputation, headed by the President, was appointed to wait on Jane, and inform her of the vote the society had been under the painful necessity of passing. She was very much respected for all her good qualities, and there was a story about her having once waylaid the reverend in his own study, and got a fellow off from severe punishment, of her own kind comfortable heart. So the deputation didn't much like the job. However, they went up, and the president told Jane all about it. Upon which Jane turned very red, burst into tears, informed the president and the deputation, in a way not at all like her usual way, that they were a parcel of malicious young savages, and turned the whole respected body out of the room. Consequently it was entered in the society's book, kept an astronomical cipher for fear of detection. That all communication with Jane was interdicted, and the president addressed the members on this convincing instance of Old Cheeseman's undermining. But Jane was as true to Old Cheeseman as Old Cheeseman was false to our fellows, in their opinion, at all events, and steadily continued to be his only friend. It was a great exasperation to the society, because Jane was as much a loss to them as she was a gain to him, and being more inveterate against him than ever, they treated him worse than ever. At last, one morning, his desk stood empty, his room was peeped into, and found to be vacant, and a whisper went about among the pale faces of our fellows that old cheeseman, unable to bear it any longer, had got up early and drowned himself. The mysterious looks of the other masters after breakfast, and the evident fact that old cheeseman was not expected, confirmed the society in this opinion. Some began to discuss whether the president was liable to hanging or only transportation for life, and the president's face showed a great anxiety to know which. However, he said that a jury of his country should find him game. And that in his address he should put it to them to lay their hands upon their hearts and say whether they as Britons approved of informers, and how they thought they would like it themselves. Some of the society considered that he had better run away until he found a forest where he might change clothes with a woodcutter, and stain his face with blackberries. But the majority believed that if he stood his ground, his father, belonging as he did to the West Indies, and being worth millions, could buy him off. All our fellows' hearts beat fast when the reverend came in, and made a sort of a Roman, or a field marshal, of himself with the ruler, as he always did before delivering an address. But their fears were nothing to their astonishment when he came out with the story that old cheeseman, so long our respected friend and fellow pilgrim in the pleasant plains of knowledge, he called him, oh yes. I dare say. Much of that. Was the orphan child of a disinherited young lady who had married against her father's wish, and whose young husband had died, and who had died of sorrow herself. And whose unfortunate baby, old cheeseman, had been brought up at the cost of a grandfather who would never consent to see it, baby, boy, or man, which grandfather was now dead. And serve him right, that's my putting in, and which grandfather's large property, there being no will, was now, and all of a sudden and forever, old cheeseman's. Our so long respected friend and fellow pilgrim in the pleasant plains of knowledge, the reverend wound up a lot of bothering quotations by saying, would, come among us once more, that day fortnight, when he desired to take leave of us himself. In a more particular manner. With these words, he stared severely round at our fellows, and went solemnly out. There was precious consternation among the members of the society, now. Lots of them wanted to resign, and lots more began to try to make out that they had never belonged to it. However, the president stuck up, and said that they must stand or fall together, and that if a breach was made it should be over his body, which was meant to encourage the society, but it didn't. 
the president further said, he would consider the position in which they stood, and would give them his best opinion and advice in a few days. This was eagerly looked for, as he knew a good deal of the world on account of his father's being in the West Indies. After days and days of hard thinking, and drawing armies all over his slate, the president called our fellows together, and made the matter clear. He said it was plain that when Old Cheeseman came on the appointed day, his first revenge would be to impeach the society, and have it flogged all round. After witnessing with joy the torture of his enemies, and gloating over the cries which agony would extort from them, the probability was that he would invite the reverend, on pretense of conversation. Into a private room, say the parlour into which parents were shown, where the two great globes were which were never used, and would there reproach him with the various frauds and oppressions he had endured at his hands. At the close of his observations he would make a signal to a prize-fighter concealed in the passage, who would then appear and pitch into the reverend, till he was left insensible. Old Cheeseman would then make Jane a present of from five to ten pounds, and would leave the establishment in fiendish triumph. The president explained that against the parlour part, or the Jane part, of these arrangements he had nothing to say. But, on the part of the society, he counseled deadly resistance. With this view he recommended that all available desks should be filled with stones, and that the first word of the complaint should be the signal to every fellow to let fly at old cheeseman. The bold advice put the society in better spirits, and was unanimously taken. A post about old cheeseman's size was put up in the playground, and all our fellows practiced at it till it was dinted all over. When the day came, and places were called, every fellow sat down in a tremble. There had been much discussing and disputing as to how old cheeseman would come. But it was the general opinion that he would appear in a sort of triumphal car drawn by four horses, with two livery servants in front, and the prize-fighter in disguise up behind. So, all our fellows sat listening for the sound of wheels. But no wheels were heard, for old cheeseman walked after all, and came into the school without any preparation. Pretty much as he used to be, only dressed in black. Gentlemen, said the reverend, presenting him, our so long respected friend and fellow pilgrim in the pleasant plains of knowledge, is desirous to offer a word or two. Attention, gentlemen, one and all. Every fellow stole his hand into his desk and looked at the president. The president was all ready, and taking aim at old cheeseman with his eyes. What did old cheeseman then, but walk up to his old desk, look round him with a queer smile as if there was a tear in his eye, and begin in a quavering, mild voice, my dear companions and old friends. Every fellow's hand came out of his desk, and the president suddenly began to cry. My dear companions and old friends, said old cheeseman, you have heard of my good fortune. I have passed so many years under this roof, my entire life so far, I may say, that I hope you have been glad to hear of it for my sake. I could never enjoy it without exchanging congratulations with you. If we have ever misunderstood one another at all, pray, my dear boys, let us forgive and forget. I have a great tenderness for you, and I am sure you return it. I want in the fullness of a grateful heart to shake hands with you every one. I have come back to do it, if you please, my dear boys. Since the president had begun to cry, several other fellows had broken out here and there, but now, when old cheeseman began with him as first boy, laid his left hand affectionately on his shoulder and gave him his right. And when the president said, Indeed, I don't deserve it, sir, upon my honor I don't, there was sobbing and crying all over the school. Every other fellow said he didn't deserve it, much in the same way. But old cheeseman, not minding that a bit, went cheerfully round to every boy, and wound up with every master, finishing off the reverend last. Then a snivelling little chap in a corner, who was always under some punishment or other, set up a shrill cry of, success to old cheeseman. Hooray! The reverend glared upon him, and said, Mr. Cheeseman, sir. But, old cheeseman protesting that he liked his old name a great deal better than his new one, all our fellows took up the cry. And, for I don't know how many minutes, there was such a thundering of feet and hands, and such a roaring of old cheeseman, as never was heard. After that, there was a spread in the dining room of the most magnificent kind. Fowls, 
tongues, preserves, fruits, confectionaries, jellies, neguses, barley sugar temples, trifles, crackers, eat all you can and pocket what you like, all at old cheeseman's expense. After that, speeches, whole holiday, double and treble sets of all manners of things for all manners of games, donkeys, pony chaises, and drive yourself. Dinner for all the masters at the seven bells, twenty pounds a head our fellows estimated it at, an annual holiday and feast fixed for that day every year, and another on old cheeseman's birthday, reverend bound down before the fellows to allow it. So that he could never back out, all at old cheeseman's expense. And didn't our fellows go down in a body and cheer outside the seven bells? Oh no! But there's something else besides. Don't look at the next storyteller, for there's more yet. Next day, it was resolved that the society should make it up with Jane, and then be dissolved. What do you think of Jane being gone, though? What? Gone forever, said our fellows, with long faces. Yes, to be sure, was all the answer they could get. None of the people about the house would say anything more. At length, the first boy took upon himself to ask the Reverend whether our old friend Jane was really gone. The Reverend, he has got a daughter at home, turn up nose, and red, replied severely, yes, sir, Miss Pitt is gone. The idea of calling Jane, Miss Pitt. Some said she had been sent away in disgrace for taking money from Old Cheeseman. Others said she had gone into Old Cheeseman's service at a rise of ten pounds a year. All that our fellows knew, was, she was gone. It was two or three months afterwards, when, one afternoon, an open carriage stopped at the cricket field, just outside bounds, with a lady and gentleman in it, who looked at the game a long time and stood up to see it played. Nobody thought much about them, until the same little snivelling chap came in, against all rules, from the post where he was scout, and said, It's Jane. Both elevens forgot the game directly, and ran crowding round the carriage. It was Jane. In such a bonnet. And if you'll believe me, Jane was married to old Cheeseman. It soon became quite a regular thing when our fellows were hard at it in the playground, to see a carriage at the low part of the wall where it joins the high part, and a lady and gentleman standing up in it, looking over. The gentleman was always old Cheeseman, and the lady was always Jane. The first time I ever saw them, I saw them in that way. There had been a good many changes among our fellows then, and it had turned out that Bob Tartar's father wasn't worth millions. He wasn't worth anything. Bob had gone for a soldier, and old Cheeseman had purchased his discharge. But that's not the carriage. The carriage stopped, and all our fellows stopped as soon as it was seen. So you have never sent me to Coventry after all, said the lady, laughing, as our fellows swarmed up the wall to shake hands with her. Are you never going to do it? Never. Never. Never, on all sides. I didn't understand what she meant then, but of course I do now. I was very much pleased with her face though, and with her good way, and I couldn't help looking at her, and at him too, with all our fellows clustering so joyfully about them. They soon took notice of me as a new boy, so I thought I might as well swarm up the wall myself, and shake hands with them as the rest did. I was quite as glad to see them as the rest were, and was quite as familiar with them in a moment. Only a fortnight now, said old Cheeseman, to the holidays. Who stops? Anybody? A good many fingers pointed at me, and a good many voices cried, he does. For it was the year when you were all away. And rather low I was about it, I can tell you. Oh, said old Cheeseman. But it's solitary here in the holiday time. He had better come to us. So I went to their delightful house, and was as happy as I could possibly be. They understand how to conduct themselves towards boys, they do. When they take a boy to the play, for instance, they do take him. They don't go in after it's begun, or come out before it's over. They know how to bring a boy up, too. Look at their own. Though he is very little as yet, what a capital boy he is. Why, my next favorite to Mrs. Cheeseman and Old Cheeseman, is Young Cheeseman. So, now I have told you all I know about Old Cheeseman. 
And it's not much after all, I am afraid. Is it? Nobody's story. He lived on the bank of a mighty river, broad and deep, which was always silently rolling on to a vast undiscovered ocean. It had rolled on, ever since the world began. It had changed its course sometimes, and turned into new channels, leaving its old ways dry and barren, but it had ever been upon the flow, and ever was to flow until time should be no more. Against its strong, unfathomable stream, nothing made head. No living creature, no flower, no leaf, no particle of animate or inanimate existence, ever strayed back from the undiscovered ocean. The tide of the river set resistlessly towards it. And the tide never stopped, any more than the earth stops in its circling round the sun. He lived in a busy place, and he worked very hard to live. He had no hope of ever being rich enough to live a month without hard work, but he was quite content, God knows, to labor with a cheerful will. He was one of an immense family, all of whose sons and daughters gained their daily bread by daily work, prolonged from their rising up betimes until their lying down at night. Beyond this destiny he had no prospect, and he sought none. There was overmuch drumming, trumpeting, and speech-making, in the neighborhood where he dwelt, but he had nothing to do with that. Such clash and uproar came from the Bigwig family, at the unaccountable proceedings of which race, he marveled much. They set up the strangest statues, in iron, marble, bronze, and brass, before his door. And darkened his house with the legs and tails of uncouth images of horses. He wondered what it all meant, smiled in a rough good-humored way he had, and kept at his hard work. The Bigwig family, composed of all the stateliest people thereabouts, and all the noisiest, had undertaken to save him the trouble of thinking for himself, and to manage him and his affairs. Why truly, said he, I have little time upon my hands. And if you will be so good as to take care of me, in return for the money I pay over, for the Bigwig family were not above his money, I shall be relieved and much obliged, considering that you know best. Hence the drumming, trumpeting, and speech-making, and the ugly images of horses which he was expected to fall down and worship. I don't understand all this, said he, rubbing his furrowed brow confusedly. But it has a meaning, maybe, if I could find it out. It means, returned the bigwig family, suspecting something of what he said, honor and glory in the highest, to the highest merit. Oh, said he. And he was glad to hear that. But, when he looked among the images in iron, marble, bronze, and brass, he failed to find a rather meritorious countryman of his, once the son of a Warwickshire wool dealer, or any single countryman whomsoever of that kind. He could find none of the men whose knowledge had rescued him and his children from terrific and disfiguring disease, whose boldness had raised his forefathers from the condition of serfs. Whose wise fancy had opened a new and high existence to the humblest, whose skill had filled the working man's world with accumulated wonders. Whereas, he did find others whom he knew no good of, and even others whom he knew much ill of. Humph, said he. I don't quite understand it. So, he went home, and sat down by his fireside to get it out of his mind. Now, his fireside was a bare one, all hemmed in by blackened streets, but it was a precious place to him. The hands of his wife were hardened with toil, and she was old before her time, but she was dear to him. His children, stunted in their growth, bore traces of unwholesome nurture, but they had beauty in his sight. Above all other things, it was an earnest desire of this man's soul that his children should be taught. If I am sometimes misled, said he, for want of knowledge, at least let them know better, and avoid my mistakes. If it is hard to me to reap the harvest of pleasure and instruction that is stored in books, let it be easier to them. But, the Bigwig family broke out into violent family quarrels concerning what it was lawful to teach to this man's children. Some of the family insisted on such a thing being primary and indispensable above all other things. And others of the family insisted on such another thing being primary and indispensable above all other things. And the Bigwig family, rent into factions, wrote pamphlets, held convocations, delivered charges, orations, and all varieties of discourses, impounded one another in courts laying courts ecclesiastical. 
threw dirt, exchanged pummelings, and fell together by the ears in unintelligible animosity. Meanwhile, this man, in his short evening snatches at his fireside, saw the demon ignorance arise there, and take his children to itself. He saw his daughter perverted into a heavy, slatternly drudge, he saw his son go moping down the ways of low sensuality, to brutality and crime. He saw the dawning light of intelligence in the eyes of his babies so changing into cunning and suspicion, that he could have rather wished them idiots. I don't understand this any the better, said he, but I think it cannot be right. Nay, by the clouded heaven above me, I protest against this as my wrong. Becoming peaceable again, for his passion was usually short-lived, and his nature kind, he looked about him on his Sundays and holidays, and he saw how much monotony and weariness there was. And thence how drunkenness arose with all its train of ruin. Then he appealed to the Bigwig family, and said, We are a laboring people, and I have a glimmering suspicion in me that laboring people of whatever condition were made, by a higher intelligence than yours. As I poorly understand it, to be in need of mental refreshment and recreation. See what we fall into, when we rest without it. Come. Amuse me harmlessly, show me something, give me an escape. But, here the Bigwig family fell into a state of uproar absolutely deafening. When some few voices were faintly heard, proposing to show him the wonders of the world, the greatness of creation, the mighty changes of time, the workings of nature and the beauties of art, to show him these things, that is to say. At any period of his life when he could look upon them, there arose among the bigwigs such roaring and raving, such pulpiting and petitioning, such maundering and memorializing, such name-calling and dirt-throwing. Such a shrill wind of parliamentary questioning and feeble replying, where I dare not, waited on, I would, that the poor fellow stood aghast, staring wildly around. Have I provoked all this, said he, with his hands to his affrighted ears, by what was meant to be an innocent request, plainly arising out of my familiar experience, and the common knowledge of all men who choose to open their eyes? I don't understand, and I am not understood. What is to come of such a state of things? He was bending over his work, often asking himself the question, when the news began to spread that a pestilence had appeared among the laborers, and was slaying them by thousands. Going forth to look about him, he soon found this to be true. The dying and the dead were mingled in the close and tainted houses among which his life was passed. New poison was distilled into the always murky, always sickening air. The robust and the weak, old age and infancy, the father and the mother, all were stricken down alike. What means of flight had he? He remained there, where he was, and saw those who were dearest to him die. A kind preacher came to him, and would have said some prayers to soften his heart in his gloom, but he replied. Oh what avails it, missionary, to come to me, a man condemned to residence in this foeded place. Where every sense bestowed upon me for my delight becomes a torment, and where every minute of my numbered days is new mire added to the heap under which I lie oppressed. But, give me my first glimpse of heaven, through a little of its light and air, give me pure water, help me to be clean. Lighten this heavy atmosphere and heavy life, in which our spirits sink, and we become the indifferent and callous creatures you too often see us. Gently and kindly take the bodies of those who die among us, out of the small room where we grow to be so familiar with the awful change that even its sanctity is lost to us. And, teacher, then I will hear, none know better than you, how willingly, of him whose thoughts were so much with the poor, and who had compassion for all human sorrow. He was at work again, solitary and sad, when his master came and stood near to him dressed in black. He, also, had suffered heavily. His young wife, his beautiful and good young wife, was dead, so, too, his only child. Master, tis hard to bear, I know it, but be comforted. I would give you comfort, if I could. The master thanked him from his heart, but, said he, O oh, you laboring men! The calamity began among you. If you had but lived more healthily and decently, I should not be the widowed and bereft mourner that I am this day. Master, returned the other, shaking his head, I have begun to understand a little that most calamities will come from us, as this one did, 
and that none will stop at our poor doors, until we are united with that great squabbling family yonder. To do the things that are right. We cannot live healthily and decently, unless they who undertook to manage us provide the means. We cannot be instructed unless they will teach us, we cannot be rationally amused, unless they will amuse us. We cannot but have some false gods of our own, while they set up so many of theirs in all the public places. The evil consequences of imperfect instruction, the evil consequences of pernicious neglect, the evil consequences of unnatural restraint and the denial of humanizing enjoyments, will all come from us, and none of them will stop with us. They will spread far and wide. They always do, they always have done, just like the pestilence. I understand so much, I think, at last. But the master said again, O oh, you laboring men! How seldom do we ever hear of you, except in connection with some trouble. Master, he replied, I am nobody, and little likely to be heard of, nor yet much wanted to be heard of, perhaps, except when there is some trouble. But it never begins with me, and it never can end with me. As sure as death, it comes down to me, and it goes up from me. There was so much reason in what he said, that the Bigwig family, getting wind of it, and being horribly frightened by the late desolation, resolved to unite with him to do the things that were right, at all events. So far as the said things were associated with the direct prevention, humanly speaking, of another pestilence. But, as their fear wore off, which it soon began to do, they resumed their falling out among themselves, and did nothing. Consequently the scourge appeared again, low down as before, and spread avengingly upward as before, and carried off vast numbers of the brawlers. But not a man among them ever admitted, if in the least degree he ever perceived, that he had anything to do with it. So nobody lived and died in the old, old, old way, and this, in the main, is the whole of nobody's story. Had he no name, you ask? Perhaps it was Legion. It matters little what his name was. Let us call him Legion. If you were ever in the Belgian villages near the field of Waterloo, you will have seen, in some quiet little church, a monument erected by faithful companions in arms to the memory of Colonel A, Major B, Captain C, D and E, Lieutenants F and G. Ensigns H, I and J, seven non-commissioned officers, and 130 rank and file, who fell in the discharge of their duty on the memorable day. The story of nobody is the story of the rank and file of the earth. They bear their share of the battle, they have their part in the victory, they fall, they leave no name but in the mass. The march of the proudest of us, leads to the dusty way by which they go. Oh! Let us think of them this year at the Christmas fire, and not forget them when it is burnt out. The End